number of historical reasoning skills. How to interpret a document, for example. How to identify continuity and change over time, for another. Today I want to focus on one of the trickier history thinking skills, evaluating cause and effect arguments. History texts are littered with causes and effects. What caused the fall of Rome? What caused World War I? What, and this is actually our question for today, caused some Paleolithic people to switch from hunting and gathering to agriculture and become Neolithic people? Sometimes we history teachers are guilty of making it sound as if cause and effect arguments are easy to make or to evaluate, and actually they're quite tricky. That's partly because most changes in history have more than one cause, but cause and effect arguments are also tricky because it's easy to draw false conclusions. So here's an example. Let's say that when you get home from school yesterday, you left your hoodie hanging on a chair in the kitchen and you forgot to put away the milk that you poured after you poured yourself a glass. Your mom or dad gets home from work and really blows up. So it's your turn for some cause-effect reasoning. What do you think caused all the screaming? So maybe it was your carelessness. But then again, maybe that isn't the correct cause-effect analysis. So here are three questions you should ask whenever you hear a cause-and-effect argument, such as, I'm yelling at you because you didn't hang up your hoodie or put the milk away. I highly recommend that you stick these three questions in the hard drive. If you get an essay question about causes and effects, you can use them to pr produce a much more sophisticated answer. And by the way, that goes for AP seminar essay questions as well as AP world history. The first question in this case isn't especially tough to answer. You did not leave the hoodie or the milk out because your mother your parents screamed at you, although I suppose it's faintly possible that you deliberately provoked a parental outburst because you enjoy watching your parents lose it. But sometimes that first question, that first issue, telling a cause from an effect is tougher. So what does this graph show? It seems to suggest that three waves of technological change, first the invention of simple tools, then the invention of agriculture, including the domestication of animals, and finally the Industrial Revolution, all caused major population growth. But it, is it possible that population growth caused the invention of agriculture? How might that argument play out? I'm going to return to that question in a minute. But first, let's ask the second test question for cause-effect arguments. Is there a reasonable connection between the cause and the effect? In this case, sure there is, especially if your mom or dad has gotten bent out of shape before about your failing to hang up your clothes or put away food. Is there a reasonable connection between the Neolithic Revolution and population growth? Yeah. So here's an explanation from one history website. In hunter-gatherer societies, women need a gap of at least three to four years between children, as multiple highly dependent babies are incompatible with a mobile lifestyle, or in plain English, they're hard to lug around. No such limitation existed when people lived in permanent settlements, and so it became possible for women to have children much more frequently. Additionally, as the techniques of plant cultivation and animal husbandry became more refined, in other words, as they learned more about selective breeding, it was possible to feed entire groups of people from relatively small numbers of food sources and, this is important, still have food left over for storage during the winter months. People and agricultural communities were less subject to the whims of nature than hunter-gatherers and thus had a higher chance of survival. Thus, a population explosion occurred, and over time, villages, then towns, and eventually cities took shape. Now, there are actually some problems with this. We'll see in a minute that agricultural societies faced new health hazards. But yes, this is a reasonable connection between cause and effect. But just to complicate the picture, population growth and agriculture were probably mutually reinforcing. More population, more food surplus, meant more people who had time to think about ways to produce more food through selective breeding, better tools, irrigation techniques, etc. 
finally, there's the third and really important question. Might there be some other possible causes, in this case, of the parental explosion, including earlier causes that are the real underlying reason for the cause you think you've observed or the cause and effect you think you've observed? Well, maybe your dad had a really bad day at work. Maybe your mom stubbed her toe on the chair where you'd hung your hoodie. Maybe one of your parents heard a news story on the radio about kids who died after drinking bad milk. So maybe your actions trigger the outburst, but didn't precisely or at least entirely cause it. For that matter, maybe an alien shapeshifter took over your mom or dad's body last year, and milk fumes mean sure death to this alien race. Okay, that one's a little far-fetched. But I can give a better example of problematic cause-effect reasoning one that required cute computers and a whole bunch of PhDs. And yes, I'm talking about a real historical study. Many years ago, the University of Michigan launched a major computer analysis uh, intended to uncover the causes of war. They were thinking big. So the university spent a huge amount of money entering reams of historical data into a computer program. And this was actually back when you had to punch data onto cards and computers took up entire rooms. And yes, I am old enough to remember that. Anyway, the historians were hunting for the causes of war by measuring events that occurred before wars broke out and looking for connections. It turned out that the researchers' most significant finding, the one with the strongest mathematical relationship between a pre preceding event and war, was the finding that wars tended to occur soon after countries involved had significantly increased their military spending. So. Do we have our cause and effect? Does higher military spending cause war? So let's apply our three tests. Which is the cause and which is the effect? Well, higher budgets came before the war, which suggests that military spending was the cause, right? Is there a reasonable connection? Well, it's not implausible that militaries, at least in some countries, are looking for opportunities to use the new weapons they've asked for and that they've paid big money for boys and their toys, etc. But, and this is the important one, are there other possible explanations? Could the first cause, higher military spending, have an earlier cause? Could we be confusing cause and effect? So, what do these two charts show about military spending in Great Britain in 1935 and 1939? Well, we see that military spending more than doubled in four years. So, does the cause-effect relationship make sense? Did higher military spending cause England to go to war with Nazi Germany in 1939? Well, we know that actually British political leaders really disliked increasing defense spending. They were still suffering from a depression, and there were a lot of things they'd rather spend money on. But here is what was happening off in Germany. Did higher defense spending cause Germany to invade Poland in 1939? It may well have made the invasion possible and successful, but in fact, there's a lot of evidence that Hitler's military ambitions made his own military very nervous. In other words, in spite of all the PhDs involved in the study and big bucks that the University of Michigan spent, they got caught up in some major logical fallacies. So a fallacy is an argument that sounds logical but has a big flaw. Here are some cause and effect fallacies. Okay, single cause should be obvious. There are very few single causes in history. A lot of factors led up to World War II, especially, of course, Adolf Hitler's ambitions. Post hoc ergo propter hoc is a great bit of Latin to show off to your parents. Literally, it means after this, therefore, because of this, or in other words, because two things happen in a certain order, the first caused the second. So in my family, well, we always pack what we call our good luck raincoats when we go on a hike. Why? Well, it has seemed to us in that in the past when we decided not to bring our raincoats because it was completely sunny outside, well, this is Utah, the clouds came out and it rained. Hmm. Anyway. Britain started spending more money on defense, and Hitler next invaded Poland. That is a post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy. But note that sometimes 
the sequence of events is a good argument for cause and effect. For example, I mentioned early that, earlier that agriculture emerged in places where sudden global cooling killed off big game and forced the population to crowd into smaller spaces where they had to figure out ways to get more food or starve. That's a logical sequence argument, although archaeologists are in fact still arguing about whether that's the cause-effect relationship. Okay, correlation versus causation is tricky partly because correlation is a complicated word. It's actually a mathematical term, sorry about that. It is a specific formula that measures how often two events happen together or in succession. And if you take statistics, you'll learn the formula. So for example, people who smoke are more likely to get cancer. That is a correlation. And in fact, it's a correlation that identifies a real cause, which we now understand much better. But you'd still need more proof. Suppose that everyone who smoked also ate broccoli and no one else ate broccoli. Maybe it's the broccoli causing the cancer. Well, actually eating broccoli has a pretty high correlation. That is statistical coincidence with reduced risk for prostate, colon, breast, lung, and skin cancers, but you should get the idea. So, how and why did hunter-gatherers take up farming? The how isn't all that hard to guess. We know from excavated Paleolithic era middens, and that's archaeology speak for Stone Age garbage heaps, that people gathered an amazing variety of wild plants. Some of them surely dropped their seeds and some bright person, I personally am betting on a woman who was tired of walking around so much, thought that it might make sense just to gather and plant some of those seeds closer to home. When I was in school, that was pretty much the end of the story. Agriculture produced more food, the population expanded, the agricultural surplus meant that not everybody had to produce food, some people could produce art or buildings or roads instead, and presto, we're on our way to civilization. Good news for the world, right? Who wouldn't want agriculture as soon as they saw those seeds sprouting or began to think about how to domesticate animals? They grabbed their chance. Except there's good evidence that that wasn't the case. So here's a quote from Professor Jack Harlan. Uh, he was one of the world's most famous archaeobotanists. I bet you didn't know there was such a thing. His research and that of other arche archaeobotanists, geographers, etc., uncovered some surprising facts about the switch from hunting and gathering to farming. Most of this, by the way, came from studying skeletons. So here are a few examples from the Jared Diamond article about the worst mistake in history that I mentioned earlier. Paleolithic people were significantly taller than their Neolithic descendants, and height is usually a pretty good measurement of both nutrition and health. Neolithic people suffered from more malnutrition. They also contracted more diseases, partly because living together in closer quarters and larger groups promoted epidemics. Agriculture was also much, much tougher on the body. So look at this ancient Egyptian papyrus. Looks like plowing was hard on the back. So we come back to our question, why did hunters and gatherers take up farming? Well, when archaeologists stopped simply celebrating the Neolithic Revolution as a human breakthrough and began asking why Paleolithic people were willing to make their own lives so much more miserable, the first theory was that at the end of the Ice Age, the Near East, which is where our agriculture was thought to have begun exclusively, uh, higher temperatures and lower precipitation encouraged people animals and potentially domesticatable plants to take refuge in oases and river valleys. As all of these species crowded into a small space, the only solution to competition for scarce food would be for humans to domesticate plants and animals. And this map of early civilizations in the Near East, which you've seen before, would seem to support that cause and effect hypothesis. So, Let's say you're an archaeologist and you want to test this hypothesis, whether there is a reasonable connection between post-Ice Age drying and the advent of agriculture and the oasis hypothesis. What questions do you ask? 
Well, one really obvious question is, did agriculture develop primarily in oases? And as archaeologists excavated more sites and began to look outside the ancient Near East, uh, they discovered that agriculture also developed in places such as Mesoamerica that did not meet these climatic conditions. Climatic conditions. So, when archaeologists decided there wasn't strong enough evidence to support the oasis hypothesis, they turned to a theory that population pressures for some people to turn to farming to starve off starvation. And this suggested that agriculture would initially appear where? Well, the marginal zone or edge hypothesis that agriculture appeared where uh, hunting and gathering was most tenuous or difficult uh, would suggest that um, we would first see agriculture again in places where the agricultural, the hunting and gathering conditions were the most difficult. So what question would you ask to test whether there was a reasonable connection between the proposed cause and effect? Well, again, I think here the research, research question is pretty obvious. And you've seen these maps before. What do they say? Well, this suggests agriculture seems to have emerged first in places with relatively plentiful rainfall and therefore lots of vegetation. In other words, places where it was easier to grow food and presumably also to gather food. Paleolithic people actually formed settled communities in the Levant before they took up agriculture, at least in a big way. Partly because of the growing concern about global warming, scholars have actually been revisiting the climate change theory. I mentioned that the younger, driest period, a cooling and drying period at the end of the last ice age, may have killed off a lot of game and forced people into closer quarters by historical terms in the ice age, a fairly quick period. But scholars still question whether the change was, in fact, sudden and drastic enough that Paleolithic people were forced to take, well, what turns out to have been the equally drastic step of becoming farmers. What does seem clear is that once the Neolithic Revolution was underway, there was no turning back. So on this chart, the orange line represents population. Note that huge jump that comes with the onset of agriculture. The uh, blue line is morbidity. Any guess what that means? It's actually the incidence of disease. Note that it too jumps up with the introduction of agriculture. More cause and effect, a plausible explanation for why population declines after a for a period after it increases. But hunting and gathering, however pleasant and healthy a lifestyle, would simply no longer support the population that agriculture had made possible. Well, if we don't know exactly why Paleolithic people adopted agriculture, we do know a lot about its consequences for human history. These were profound, and I've listed some of them here. This in turn moves us toward the first civilization, and that's where we're headed.